Good morning, everybody. My name is David Bolton. I'm a learning activist. That's what I call myself. I'm the director of a nonprofit organization in Louisville called Learning Stewards. And um, I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm glad that you made the choice to be with me this morning. And I want to thank, before we go any further, Judy Whitesell for her amazing work. Um, I've been involved in a lot of conferences, but never has one person done so much for so many in a conference that I'm aware of that in this one. Um, <clears throat> let me start off by saying that uh, I don't know you, you don't know me. Um, I don't mean any insult. Uh, I don't mean to be blaming or shaming anybody. I'm not here to sell anything or to per persuade you or con you into anything. I'm not here to stroke people or to hand out trivia. I'm here to kind of take a deep dive with you into a different way of looking at learning. probably all familiar with uh, virtual reality. It's such a big thing these days. And in virtual reality, people see things that aren't really there. And we're moving into a phase of augmented reality with Apple and Microsoft and everybody jumping on the bandwagon of being able to overlay normal reality with images that we can manipulate and see and play with. And then of course there's Facebook in the metaverse that's coming uh, of a kind of alternate parallel virtual reality that people can kind of exist in. But while these technologies are new, the idea of having some kind of a, a lens over our eyes, over our minds, through which we experience the world isn't new. We've all had that for a long, long time. This is a, an example of what I'm talking about. This comes from a um, one of the best PBS series of all time called The Day the Universe Changed. And in this 10 hour long documentary that this uh, a renowned uh, British journalist, scientific journalist did back in the 80s um, after spending 10, going into a 10 hour program that dealt with the uh, main ideas, the main insights that transformed humanity over the past 2000 years. He started with this one example. <clears throat> Somebody apparently once went up to the great philosopher Wittgenstein and said, what a lot of morons people back in the Middle Ages must have been to have looked every morning at what's going on behind me now, the dawn, and to have thought that what they were seeing was the sun going round the earth. Well, as every school kid knows, the earth goes round the sun and it doesn't take too many brains to understand that. To which Wittgenstein replied, yeah, but I wonder what it would have looked like if the sun had been going round the earth. Point being, of course, it would have looked exactly the same. You see what your knowledge tells you you're seeing. And that's exactly the point of my conversation today, is to wanting to shift the way that our mental models perceive the role of learning in, our, in human life. So whether we're talking about us as individuals, or all of us, everything depends on learning. And that if we change how we think about learning, we can change how we learn about everything. And that by this, I don't mean that I'm going to be trying to impart or dump upon you or press into you or pump into you some kind of knowledge about learning as if it's some kind of a machine on the, some schematic on the wall that we're gonna study in an abstract sense. I'm actually less interested in your knowledge about learning in the external worldly sense and more in, interested in how do you change the orientation, the mental model you have about learning so that it, the effect of that is that it changes how you learn. And to begin that process, I'm going to ask the question, what is learning? The typical response to the question or the survey, what is learning, is some variation of the process through which we acquire knowledge, skills, and experience. In fact, if you look up learning on Google or any typical encyclopedia, it will mirror that, it, right? What I wanna ask is a somewhat different question, what isn't learning? 
want to change the way we think about learning because if we change the way we think about learning, it'll change everything. People don't just get born into how to live as human beings. They have to learn how to live as human beings. We have now clearly demonstrated that brain architecture is shaped by experience, not just driven by a kind of hardwired genetic template. That is, a lot of the information that goes into building brains is not actually there in the genes. It's sort of cooked up or whipped up on the fly as brains develop. Genetic expression, the actual functioning of the genes as they make their proteins, uh, does not take place um, in a vacuum out of context. So gene expression is influenced by the environment. It's influenced by experience. Our brains really are experience-dependent learning machines. Between 12 and 36 months, basically, the kids learn to talk the way their parents do. And they learn the vocabulary, they learn the grammar and syntax, and they use their minds with the language to deal with the real world in the same way their parents do. I once had a conversation with leading researchers in Oxford University, England, who had came up with a entirely new uh, understanding of the human brain. They identified a component inside of the human brain that they said, this is the part of the brain that's most unique to humans. It's most different from all other primates, all other animals. This is the part. So I asked them, is this component something that is driven uh, structurally, maturationally, genetically? Or is this component of the brain that you've identified something that grows in response to learning? And they said, this part, that, that which makes humans human, is a, an adaptive assembly. It's built by learning. <clears throat> so whether we're talking about um, is fundamental as the way the genes wire up the brain, or we're talking about the way that our, our uh, visual cortex responds to color, or we're talking about the entire arc of human life, the way that uh, children learn language and how language then mediates their world, the way that children relate to their own emotions, how we all learn to relate to our own emotions. At one level, you could say we have a, a, uh, a, a vast emotional uh, process, part of which is neurobiological and genetic, but most of which that we experience the way that we feel as individuals, the kind of ways we've learned to cope with, manage, uh, extend our emotions, think about our emotions, be aware of our emotions, all of that's learned. And then studies of, of the aging brain indicate that the thing that keeps brains from degeneration, from falling into the various traps and diseases of old age has to do with whether or not they stay learning. So my point is at, at this point, at this thing is, is that contrary to the way that the definitions work about learning, that define learning as a, uh, a kind of utility. Think of learning as a one of the things humans do, like we eat and we talk and we meet with people and we uh, make food and we dance and we do all this kind of stuff. And then learning is one of the things we do. That's really wrong. And it misorients everything. Rather than learning being one of the things we do, learning is the central dynamic in everything we do. And not seeing that misorients how we teach, how we parent, how we learn ourselves. So these are some common ways that um, our understanding about learning gets warped. Um, I think, therefore I am. Knowledge is power, character is destiny. You probably heard all these things. When we say, I think, therefore I am, that's true, but I learned how to think. There's nothing about the content of my thought or the strategies I think with or the way that I think that isn't a consequence of learning. I didn't come with any of that. So it's not just that uh, I learn um, to think. It's not just that I learn. I am learned. Who I am as a person is learned more than anything else. Knowledge is power. This is another common uh, theme throughout uh, you know, the past few hundred years in history. And yet, it's not just knowledge is power. If we look at the way that knowledge works, has worked historically, and does work today, 
the, the number one power of knowledge is how it resources ongoing learning. After all, it's knowledge is kind of like the, the, the golden eggs and learning is the golden goose. This is true in so many dimensions. If we look at, I mean, we, used, we, we not that long ago gave a Nobel Prize to somebody that was sticking an ice pick up the eyeballs of children to change their behavior. The greatest revolutions in physics throughout the past 200 years have always thought that they understood the basic laws of the universe. And every time they think they know, they find out, nope, what they knew was not accurate. It goes on and on and on. I could spend hours just on the different ways in which um, learning is much more powerful than knowledge, that knowledge in effect is a resource to learning. Character is destiny. This is another one of those common themes that is so com so commonplace in the way that people think about and that hides learning. So what destines character? Do people choose their race or gender or body type or family or the schools they go to or the neighborhood they grew up in? No, they... <clears throat> All of these things impact and are environments in which humans learn to become who they become in. Another term that's pretty common out there is lifelong learner. So lifelong learner is also one of those deceptive terms that kind of hides our attention, hides our understanding about learning because many people use that phrase, but, it, but we don't use phrases like lifelong heartbeater or lifelong breather or lifelong walker or talker, right? So why do we say lifelong learning? It kind of implies that we could be otherwise. It kind of implies that learning isn't always going on. And that's the next point and probably the most important point. We have all of these terms grow up. When we talk about grow up, do we really mean somebody physically grew up? I mean, that's part of it for sure, but we really mean that something inside of them grew up. And I would say learned up. They learn to become who they become. A ch child's body is growing all the time for sure, but the personality, the person inside that body is learning to become who they become. Adaption, evolving, raising children, nurturing, lifestyle. Lifestyle is another one of those terms. They, they hide the, the, the underlying implicit fact that what we're really describing is learning. Neuroplasticity, acquired knowledge, uh, conditioning, all of these terms are different ways of describing learning that kind of hide learning from our attention. How did we become such a learning disabled country? We learned to. Not only are we individually who we become through learning, not only do we learn to become who we become in every dimension of life not genetically determined, we are who we learn to be collectively. Across the world, people with equal intelligence, equally complex language can be living in radically different cultures with radically different kinds of technologies. Um, those that can look as the Stone Age of millions, a million years ago, those that can look uh, as modern as we are today sitting uh, in this studio. Um, the same brains can be producing all of those systems, in part because it's not all inside the head. Changes in the human lifestyle for the last 50,000 years have had very little to do with any biological change in our brains. The reason that we live differently today from the way the, the cavemen lived is not because we have better brains, but because we've been accumulating all of the thousands of discoveries that our ancestors have made, and we have the benefit of a huge history of inventions that we communicate non-genetically through language, through documents, through customs. We are who we learn to be. 
And when we think about the various challenges that face humanity today, whether it's climate change or gender, or it's get, making business more effective, or the incredible cost of healthcare, or our disabled politics, whatever the dimension is, the shortest path between here and some kind of resolution is learning. So hopefully if I've done anything so far, what, what I've tried to do is to say, it's time to stretch our mental model about learning from it being a ancillary mental utility, just one of the things we do in order to acquire knowledge and, and skills to being, no, 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 it's the central dynamic through which we become who we become in every way. Everything about who we become as individuals is a consequence of our learning, right? The things that, that are, are genetically determined or determined by uh, some other agency, if you want to go into that, those things are outside the scope of our agency, outside the scope of our control. Everything that's within the scope of human agency is inside the scope of human learning. And if we don't see that, if we don't understand that we are always learning all the time, then we're going to miss understanding how learning is leading us astray. We're gonna miss uh, seeing the role of learning in all the things we don't think are learned. And that's part of what propagates so many of our problems and challenges today. So this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Leonardo da Vinci and it kind of sets up the next phase of things, right? The best thing he had to do with us had nothing to do with artistic matters Learning was the only thing that would never fail us. As beautiful as that is, he was really wrong. Learning can be adaptive and healthy. And when it is, it acts like scaffolding that we extend ourselves on, right? Just like it, it, it'll, it, without limiting us, it provides us an opportunity to extend our learning. Right, so there's healthy adaptive learning. And we could spend an hour just on that part of the conversation. But there's another part of the conversation that's, that's the important part to draw your attention to this morning, which has to do with the unhealthy or maladaptive. How many of you have ever really given thought to how powerfully unhealthy learning can be? There's a sort of intuition that all of the change that occurs in these learning uh, contexts is positive. That if I add throw emotion on, I learn better, right? Not right, that's not correct. Just as learning is responsible for all the positive things in human existence, it's also responsible for all of the negative things. From addictions, the current state of our thinking about various kinds of addictions is that they're a consequence of maladaptive learning. And this, this goes all the way to school. A, a great degree of the difficulty that children have in school is a consequence of maladaptive cognitive schema. If you've worked with a child who's struggling to read past a certain point, then one of the things that you've encountered is their guessing strategies. If, if you can hear, if, if you have ever paid attention to where those guessing strategies have come from, this is a learned maladaptive response to the confusion of learning to read. So there's two types of maladaptive learning to draw your attention to. One is the kind of cognitive, like I mentioned a moment ago, where somebody comes up with a various strategy to, a, to address a learning challenge and the strategy is misleading their learning, right? So there's there's the um, maladaptive cognitive schema, if you will. The other kind of difficulty that um, pervades education with respect to maladaptive learning is what I call mind shame. We haven't recognized in modern pedagogy the experience of shame and how it prevents children from learning. They develop a sense of, of, of shame around their lack of capacity. And uh, 
again, this manifests in lots and lots of different ways. Uh, disinterest, defiance, uh, inattentiveness. Takes hostage, takes the cognition hostage. Yeah, it paralyzes the child. Yeah, yeah. It grows in the brain like a monster. Everything else is degraded. So here I'm growing something that you could say like, is like a great fear or a great obsession, and its power in the brain is growing and growing and growing. They begin to say things to themselves like, I am, I'm no good, or I can't do this, which in, inhibits their ability to maintain attention and actually uh, recruit their cognitive processes. It's a very uh, maladaptive feedback cycle uh, that you approach a task with anxiety because of concerns about your own performance. That distracts from your attention, uh, your ability to uh, focus on and process the information that's being provided, which impairs your performance more, which increases your anxiety, and this cycle continues to amplify itself. If they're distracted by the feeling that they cannot do the task well, if they're saying to themselves at the same time, I'm not good at this, I don't like this, this is not fun, uh, other children do this better than I do, I'm never going to learn it, that those, all that talk and that emotional arousal is taking up what people call M space or cognitive space in a task. And when that happens, those distractions diminish the child's ability to actually do the task that they're now struggling with. So there's a negative side. There's a dark side to what's happening. People can be ashamed of a lot of things. They can be ashamed of their body. They can be ashamed of their um, behaviors. And they can be ashamed of their minds what I call mind shame. It's the biggest learning disability in our planet, right? When, when, when children experience protracted confusion and can't find a way out of it for a long period of time, you know, where they're stuck in it, um, they, they, they tend to blame themselves. And in blaming themselves, they start shaming themselves. And in shaming themselves, the shame reaction to confusion disables their capacity or reduces, dramatically reduces their capacity to learn their way through it. Right. I kept messing up on the words and people kept laughing at me. And they said that you don't know how to read. I bet you won't be able to how to read when you grow up. They always laugh at me if I get twisted up with words. It makes, it makes my heart drop because it seems like they're not my friend no more. My teacher asked me to come into the front of the class and read a book and everybody was just staring at me and I got real nervous because I didn't want to mess up or anything. And then when I started reading, I started messing up and I just couldn't help it and everybody started laughing at me and stuff. So Like the teacher would ask me to read something and I would read it and I'll get a wrong word or I'll go too slow and they'll make fun of me. Ever since then, I've been comfortable reading in front of people, and they made fun of me and stuff. So I just never really liked to read after that. Society don't want you because you know you can't read. That's just the way I feel. I'm just an outcast to the whole world, you know, like a waste of breath. Right. So my point in this part of the um, process is that learning is not only um, uh, can be healthy and adaptive, which we all kind of understand and experience, but learning has this dark side. Learning can be profoundly unhealthy, but learning can lead people to be self-sabotaging. Now, I'm bringing this up to your attention. Remember, the first step in our conversation was to change the dimensions, the definition of learning, so that rather than thinking of learning in this kind of narrow utilitarian way, think of it more generally as the central dynamic in being human. And the next important part to get in this, this pathway towards becoming a steward of learning is to recognize and be able to see and read when you see it, the unhealthy learning that pervades what's going on for the struggling child. And if you're honest with yourself and as you learn to pay more attention to this, it's also going on inside of you. One of the most powerful things about shame is that it can it steers what we're aware of in a way that we're unconscious of. If you pay, start paying attention to it, you realize that you're circumnavigating the world, avoiding certain things that cause you to feel bad about yourself. And the big question that 
for me that's kind of animated my work for, for decades is what happens, just like when somebody's ashamed of their teeth, they don't smile, or ashamed of their voice, they may not sing, or ashamed of their dancing and they avoid dancing, or they're ashamed of, of their ability to throw a football or a baseball or a bowl or whatever, and they don't want to do that anymore. Um, so we avoid the things that cause us to feel ashamed of ourselves. What happens when learning causes us to feel ashamed of ourselves, when learning situations caused us to feel ashamed of ourselves, when, when confusion causes us to feel ashamed of ourselves, then our avoidance of the shame becomes learning disabling. And I submit to you, that is the number one learning disability in, in, in our population. Look at these are the stats of the American public education system just prior to the pandemic. They're, they're not new, as you can see on the left-hand side. It's been for as long as we've kept data, almost three decades, that the majority of our children at all grade levels has, have been underwater, below proficiency with reading. What does that mean? That means that the brain work of reading is not transparent to learning through reading that it's obscuring their learning, right? And that radiates to affect almost everything else because once you become un less than sufficiently confident in your learning, then it, it starts to affect how you're learning about everything. Once you hit the wall with confusion and confusion triggers shame, right? Then you get to the situation where other, other times where confusion triggers shame causes that same reaction, that same avoidance. Look at in the red numbers are how many children are below proficiency, below grade level on everything we keep track of. Now, what, one part of this is the tragedy of what this means in terms of their lack of skill and proficiency. But the bigger thing and the more important thing to me is what does this mean in terms of their experience of school? What it means is that because mo most of our children are chronically improficient in the skills that are most important for their success, that's the message they're getting from education. What they're learning from school is to be ashamed of their minds. How could they take it otherwise? How could you be day after day, week after week, month after month, in some cases year after year in an environment that's constantly telling you're not good enough? What does it do to you? What does it do to your faith in your own capacity to learn? So what we're talking about is a situation where it's perfectly emotionally intelligent for a child to want to avoid the things that cause them to feel shame. Don't get me wrong, shame can be a great motivator. And in some cases it will motivate somebody to push past their limitations and get better at whatever it is they're struggling with. But most of the time, and you can check this with your own personal first person experience. Most of the time, when you feel shame, you want to avoid it. So the, the smart, intelligent avoidance of the things that's causing you to shame can, if, if what's causing you to shame, feel shame is learning situations, then the emotional intelligence will, be, will cause you to become learning disabled. I'm watching some of the uh, notes in the chat room, and I would just say that you can tell them what you that they're good all the time. I was part of the arguments uh, pro and con in the self-esteem movement 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and what's really clear is is that the kids know. You can tell them all you want with uh, encouraging words, and it's not that that's not helpful, but if their pervasive experience is not being good enough. We got to change the conditions, the context of their experience, change the scaffolding to increase their likelihood of being success, help them understand how to manage shame, pumping them up with positive uh, messages that they're good when they know they're not doesn't work. And that's been proven scientifically. So again, it's not just that they're hitting the wall, it's that they're hitting the wall and feeling completely uh, ashamed of their minds as a consequence. Well, the Neurons Neighborhoods report uh, was very emphatic in stating that uh, children are born ready to learn. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to make them ready to learn. We don't have to teach them 
how to learn. They are kind of wired from the beginning to learn, and they're wired to experience um, and to master the world around them. Human beings are born naturally learning oriented. Look at that kind of stutter in their flow of walking. Watch. That process is a model of the way natural learning works, which is paying attention on the live edge of right now, on the sensorily present live edge of right now. That's what human babies, that's what human children are fantastic at. They're born learning oriented to do that. You don't need to teach them to do that. They learn to do that on their own. But while they're, they're, they're naturally learning oriented in environments that give them this kind of um, positive feedback on the edge of their doing, whether it's talking or it's tasting or it's touching, it's moving, it's manipulating fine objects, all of those things are learning on the edge of now learning on the live edge of now, where they're getting feedback on the live edge of now about what they're doing. Now contrast that with what goes on in school. What goes on in school is that they can no longer trust the live edge of their learning and their own sensory participation as a source of intelligence to know whether what they're doing is right or wrong. In the case of reading, for example. Some people there are who being grown forget the horrible task of learning to read. It is perhaps the greatest single effort that the human undertakes, and he must do it as a child. I mean, here the kid grew up in his whole life, he never saw an object that changed its name when it changed its position. And yet, this is B. Is it B now? No. Is it B now? Yes. Is it B now? No. Is it B now? No. Is it B now? Yes. We're talking about children experiencing a form of confusion that's unnatural to their organism. I, I think that's an that's a interesting and good way to frame things. <clears throat> Point being that whether we're talking about um, reading or math or writing or any of their downstream explicates, the things that we do with those things, those are all artificial. They're human inventions. The child's learning has to now adapt itself, not to its internal compass, like in walking, talking, listening, tasting, touching, smelling, but now it has to uh, compass it, uh, their learning in relation to an external technological convention, right? That difference between natural and artificial learning is what's causing most of the mind shame that's causing most of the difficulty for most of the children because we don't recognize the distinction. So we back up again and say, get out of this. <clears throat> so again, first thing, expand the definition of learning. Learning is a central dynamic of human being, uh, of being human, not just an ancillary mental utility for acquisition. Secondly, Learning can be profoundly unhealthy. And if you can't read that in yourself and in others, then you're going to be oblivious to that and you're not going to be able to help them. You can pump all the sunshine at them you want. If they're feeling that inside and you're oblivious to it, you're not going to be able to help them. You got to be able to track with them on the edge of what they're experiencing. And at that point, conduct scaffold, help them through their challenges in a way that is also contextualizing their emotional experience in a way to reduce the self-blame, right? So we have expanding learning. We have the difference between healthy and unhealthy um, learning as it relates to how they're feeling and how that uh, relates to their uh um, agency, their faith and confidence. And then you have the distinction between natural and artificial learning. If right now we tend to blur those together, we tend to, we fail to make a dis sufficient distinction between natural modes of learning and artificial modes of learning. And yet it is the artificial modes of learning that's causing most of the children, most of the difficulty they're experiencing that's causing them to have most of the mind shame that's poisoning them. So now we move into the stewarding part. We needed those things as backgrounds. 
if, if you've any, if any of you been paying attention to what's going on in the world, then you have already a sense of how rapidly the world is changing. Used to be, before your time, but certainly within my time, that it took a, a computer the size of the room you're in or bigger to equal anywhere near the power that you carry around in your hand today. We now have a supercomputer that can calculate in one second what it would take a human being six billion years to do. The technology is getting off scale more powerful every day. This was just yesterday. DeepMind, Google's uh, artificial intelligent program, uh, was involved in a competition with 5,000 programmers, human programmers, and it came out uh, uh, in the top 54%. In other words, it beat the average uh, human at programming software. So what does this mean? Whether we're talking about um, the, uh, we, have we have technology today in which a uh, college professor is can be replaced by artificial intelligence that's uh, able to discern and judge the subjective qualities of PhD thesis. We're not talking about stupid automation anymore. Clearly, fast food work is going to go the way of robots. Uh, as you're already aware of, truck drivers are, are going to become largely extinct. A warehouse automation has taken over the role of jobs uh, on and on and on, right? So in, we're talking about um, a world in which the majority of the jobs of the future, the majority of the opportunities for jobs in the future are going to be um, based on not something that you learned in school, but your ongoing capacity to learn in a world that's beyond the capability of any of us right now to predict. What is uh, important about education It's not that somebody knows the current science because the current science might be wrong, but it's that somebody knows how to learn about new science and adapt to do something that they had never even thought about doing when they were in school. That's the key element. The goal of education is not content. Content's going to continually change in this rapidly changing technological world. The issue is learning to learn and enjoying the learning process itself. How do we prepare children for a world in which robots and AI systems are going to be able to be more cost effective um, employees, if you will, than human beings will be? What are they going to do? What are we teaching them today? What are we teaching them today when we're talking about a, a world in which <clears throat> everything that's known to humanity can be put on a phone or a, the future of phone-like devices and provided to them by asking a question? When they can learn whatever they need to learn, when they need to learn it with the devices that are coming. If DeepMind can beat today's programmers, in a coding competition, what will it be like 10 years from now? My point is, is that nothing's more important to our children's futures than how well they can learn when they get there. Anything we're teaching today is nothing more than scaffolding for how well they're learning, how well they're participating, how well they're able to participate as they go forth. And that, when they arrive into their future, right? It's how well they can learn when they're there that's gonna be more important than, than anything else. So you could say that whatever we're teaching them today is at best scaffolding. What that means is that there's, there's and this is really hard for educators, right? But I really ask you to consider this. There's nothing that we think they should learn that's more important than how well they can learn. Let me, let me ask this question. Have you ever met, has anybody here ever met a toddler 
who gave up on walking because it was too much of a pain in the butt to keep falling? Nice smile. You have? Brittany says. Gave up? Stopped walking? Everybody's saying yes to that. I can't believe that. I, I'm, so they stayed toddlers their entire life? Are you really telling tell me that? It can't be. My point is, is that children have an innate faith, just like with talking and eating by themselves and ultimately going to the bathroom. I can't believe this. People are saying that people get, kids gave up on walking. I, I've never heard of that. Now, please send me emails uh, about that one. Uh, I would love to, to hear any stories. That, yeah, keeps, of course, they keep coming back. My point is, is that we don't have to teach them to have a, an, appetite, an attitude and an appetite for learning. They're born that way, right? The problem is they learn otherwise. They're learning in environments that are causing them to learn that they can't trust learning. <laughs> so I just wanna close by saying, whether you care about the planet, you care about economics, you care about the uh, uh, future of healthcare or the uh, problems with um, the uh, <clears throat> politics in this nation or ageism or any number of things, the, the thing that's gonna make a difference in the future is how well our children learn when they get there. And that, that means that our job as parents and educators is to steward how health the health of their learning, how healthily they're becoming themselves, how healthily they're learning to become who they're becoming at all, at, all, at all times, and how healthily they're learning to have faith and trust in their ability to learn. Because no matter what we have to teach them, it's not worth hurting, damaging, retarding, uh, injuring that, that kind of health, that importance, the importance of their faith and confidence in their capacity to learn. That's the center of the health of their learning. Um, I just wanna say, again, I appreciate the time that we've had together. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties we've experienced. I hope that you've come away from this, like I said in the beginning, with a changed sense of what learning is that then changes how you learn. It's how you learn is the most single most important thing um, to how well you can help others learn. If you're not aware of your own unhealthy learning, you're not gonna be very good at helping somebody else through theirs. If you're not aware of the distinction between natural and artificial, you're not gonna be very good at conducting the different kinds of learning uh, scaffolding that's required to get through the uh, artificial. If you, think of, if you don't think that how they're learning to behave um, is as important as how they're learning to do things, how they're becoming themselves is as important as how they're learning to do things or perform with respect to some academic challenge, then you miss the boat on what learning is. Yes, I, the kids are not in the world we once in. Our experience of the world is almost irrelevant to the kind of world that's unfolding. And to impose our ideas upon them um, is to do them a disservice. Again, the, the greatest uh, force, the greatest uh, um, attribute, asset that they have as they go into their world is a faith and confidence in their ability to learn. And that's what you've got to be most uh, supportive of. But is it wrong to not at least put some of what we had when we were growing up into what they had? Because I feel like sometimes they're so reliant on technology and I understand that's what they're growing up with the iPad and the tablet but sometimes I don't even think they know how to be like just regular kids and do things as what we did when we were kids because I look at them and I'm just like well that's different yeah like, well, I, a couple, I, you said a couple of things put into right um is a uh, a, a, that's a questionable way of thinking about this, I think. Um, the other thing is, is that we talk about technology. You have to remember that reading and writing is technology. 
television's technology, radio's technology, the thoughts in your head for the most part are technology in that reading and writing change the way oral language works in a fundamental ways that makes the way that we think with language today technological. So the technology that's evolving in the outer world, crude and problematic in many ways that it is, is actually more neurologically efficient for the way the brain wants to learn than the older technologies that we grew up with. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of uh, challenges that we face, but I would not think that, um, well, on the one hand, it's definitely important to encourage the, the difference between kind of human to human uh, emotional relational learning is different than technological learning. And, and I'm all for that. I think the classrooms of the future need to be uh, more dialogical, more about learning to be present together uh, than it is about using uh, uh, just technology. But when it comes to knowledge and skills that are technological anyway, like reading, writing, math, and all kinds of other things, then using technology to facilitate that, absolutely. Everybody's quiet. Anything else? Thank you. Well, I think there's I a lot think, more. Go ahead. I, I think as educators, we need to look and dive a little bit more under the maladaptive learning in children um, and make sure that we try to uh, guide them out of those learning styles so that they won't feel inferior with their learning for the rest of their lives so that we can curtail it at a young age so they won't they, it won't travel with them through uh, middle school Ex and yeah high school. Exa exactly that's a great takeaway like I said about the kid not uh, the, the toddler not giving up on walking right they have this faith we don't have to teach them to have faith in learning they have it we have to stop them from learning to not trust that which is a different challenge. And that's what's happening now. And it's not because of natural learning challenges, it's because of artificial learning challenges that they're losing faith in learning. And it's because us adults don't understand the difference sufficiently to scaffold them through the artificial learning challenges. So yeah, uh, it, it's a, go ahead. I, I, I wonder, is it just not what we can do as educators because I know everybody has heard this phrase, it all begins at home. Sometimes I feel like the parents kind of put it on us to be their all in all. And I feel like they like push it on us to like teach them everything. But isn't it like, wouldn't it be it's helpful both, it's, if the parents? Absolutely it would. Absolutely it would. But, and um, by the way, and I didn't have time to even touch on this, but I have a free technology, a free technology that is a transformative new kind of way to, to support learning to read and reading to learn. And anybody who sends me anything, I will send you a, a link to use it, to use it free with you, your family, your kids, whatever. Um, to your point, yes, no question about it, that family's the source, the environment. And some of the videos I showed show that children learn to become like their parents in so many ways. So if their parents are modeling healthy learning, then their children are going to pick up on all kinds of unhealthy learning habits that sabotage them. Not only that, they will become insufficiently ready for the learning challenges that they face. So like, for example, you've probably heard of the 30 million word um, limit or the 30 million word gap and how that affects children's trajectory through school, that some kids come from comparatively taciturn families and the difference in language exposure, um, both its emotional implications, its cognitive implications, its linguistic implications, causes children to be unready for the challenges of reading and for other academic challenges down the road, right? It's all coming out of that home. But even though these things are coming out of the home, we can't just say, well, if the child didn't come out of the home the right way, that's all that's done. We still have to say that the next best point to intercept the trajectory of children and help them become healthy learners is in school. So whereas no question about it, the formative early learning that establishes a life learning trajectory is coming out of the home, 
the most important next step is what happens in school. And in school is where the artificial learning challenges really start to hit. Because the thing is, I come from a background of speech, so I understand the reading to learn versus learning to read. My thing is, is that um, if they're not getting, like we could, as teachers, we could send out all the links like Ready Rosie and stuff like that because we have our own links to send out to them. If they're not taking advantage of it, what else can we do? Because I have children that it's a simple task and they already start off with, I can't. I'm like, you yeah, didn't even yeah. try yet. And then yeah, when but, they but, do, that, it's the, like, the I, yeah. the I can't, the I can't is an emotional protector, right? If they say they can't, then they're pushing it away so that they don't have to feel the shame of not being good enough at it. So you have to recognize that the I can't is a maladaptive strategy to protect themselves from shame. Just like it is with us, whatever it is you can't, right? That's how that works. So mm -hmm. again, I'm not saying that the, that, that the origin of this isn't within, within the families. Ultimately, parents need to understand that their biggest role in, in terms of being a parent is stewarding the health of their children's learning. That, that doesn't require a book or a knowledge or a course. It requires an orientation shift, just like I've been trying to advocate today with you guys. That it's about changing how you think about learning so that you can learn about learning in a different way, pay attention to learning in a different way. So how do you deal with the parents? You, you try to uh, impress upon them uh, through communications and resources. And I've got a lot of resources you can use to help in that. Uh, uh, I'm doing a international parents conference in two weeks. Um, and things that I've done like that are, are available for parents. You have to get parents to understand that their role in life is, if they care about their child, if they love their child, if they want the best for their child, the single most important thing they can do is steward how healthy that child is learning to become their future selves in every dimension in which they are learning to become. And that's why, again, if they think learning is just this academic thing on the side, then they're not paying attention to what's most important in how children become who they become. I'm not sure this chat's going to survive. So those of you that have sent me email addresses, please uh, go to my site and send them as well, okay? Just to make sure I, I don't have control over the technology when they shut off the session, which I imagine uh, will happen soon. I really enjoyed this. Again, I'm so sorry for the technical snafus in the beginning of it. Thank you for the class. I really loved how you read in detail and where we um information and how it could help us with the kids, how the the help the help in the and stuff. Yeah, that's what I live to do. And so any of you can contact me at any point in time and I will be as helpful as I possibly can in providing resources and guidance coaching and um, and I'd love to be coming to your school either virtually or actually and working with other teachers and uh, parents in your area. We got to change the trajectory of what's going on in this country and it starts with changing the learning trajectory of the population and that starts with changing the learning trajectory of the children. And it's not about what we teach them, it's about how generally well they can learn in ways we, that are beyond what we're teaching them. When we think it's what we're teaching them is more important than how well they can learn, we do a fundamental and profound disservice to them. Well, I'm here standing by to be here for as long as they let us before they cut us off, which I'm surprised they haven't already. So if there's any more questions, happy to, to go into them. Thank you very oh, much. Um, really enjoyed the session. Thank you, thank you. I was gonna say, uh, Mr. David, I love the, um, how we all talk about too, that it's not just us, he's just, we should all work together too to help the kids along and not to tell them or guide them and keep being positive and tell them, you could do this, you could do this, I know you can. Yes, no question about that in terms of the positive affirmations and positive confirmations. But like I said, you have to be careful because they know what's true. You can't BS them with positivity when they know something's not working. 
when they when you say, oh, you're going to be great at reading, and they're pounding their head against the not be not getting through, or math. I mean, the majority of people that struggle with math don't struggle with math because they have some kind of internal innate learning deficit with respect to math. They struggle with math because early on in a math exposure, they came to feel bad about themselves for doing math. And the emotional uh, response to the confusion of math caused them to feel bad about themselves. And that disturbs their mental capacity to learn to get better at math. And it becomes a downward spiral, just like with reading, just like with writing, just like with just about everything. So we can't, um, we can't fool them. They know what's working and when it's not working. So we have to become scrupulously better at scaffolding them into success while contextualizing their difficulties as it's not their fault because self-blame is what triggers the shame which disables their learning. So some David, folks are asking you to, you to share your email again. Um, some are asking to share your email again before the chat disappears or but because they didn't get it. Um, okay. just, just an FYI. Yes, thank you. Again, there's a sign up um, page on my, oops, here we go. There's a sign up page on learningstewards.org contact form. And if you do that, that will plug you in not only to getting responses from me, but um, you'll be able to see, if you go to my blogs, you'll be able to see the information on the new reading technology and on other ideas. And my site, the Learning Steward site, covers these points in much more detail with much with video support and a lot better than I could do today under our circumstances on every point from expanding learning to artificial learning to healthy and unhealthy learning um, to the challenge of learning to read um, and so forth. Was a great class, thank you so much. I appreciated yeah. the deep dive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Good luck with the rest of the conference.